the last four weeks, we've been talking about forgiveness. We've talked a lot about how to forgive people who have wronged you, even how to forgive yourself when you failed miserably. But if you missed any of those weeks, I highly recommend that you go back and listen either online or in the First NLR app. If you don't have the First NLR app, you can download it by clicking that QR code provided in the bulletin or just right here on the screen. It'll help you a lot if you'll uh, get that. But you know, we, we're going to look at the different side of the forgiveness issue today. What do you need to know and what do you need to do when you are the one who requires forgiveness, when you are the offender? We've all been there. And I vividly remember a moment in my time here at First NLR where I found myself in that exact position. Now, before I share this story this morning, um, it's important that you know it took place here at First NLR 22 years ago. Uh, it's a story that up until now, I have actually been forbidden by Pastor Rod to share publicly, at least here and in this setting. In fact, for many years, he forbid me to even speak of the incident. But rest assured, I got permission from him before sharing it today. See, the year was 2002. I was chosen to be the lead role in our Easter production here at the church. Now, we had four performances over Easter weekend, and I was the narrator who was telling the story of Jesus through the eyes of the people, the crowd. And to get ready for it, I had grown a full beard and, you know, I was dressed in the full biblical costume, even had the, the head wrap. As a matter of fact, it was so tight I could barely feel my head, but I, I was ready. And on the night of the final performance, there was a period of about 15 minutes where I didn't have to be on the stage. Uh, so I decided that I would go to our media room to watch the production on one of the, the TV monitors. Now, on my way there, I passed by our prop room, and I noticed a prop that had been used in past Christmas shows. Uh, it was a Keystone Cop hat. In fact, it was this very Keystone Cop hat. And as I saw it, I had an idea that I thought was just brilliant. I thought, I'll put this on my head and walk into the media room where several of our staff were, and I'll get a big laugh. You know, I thought that was what would happen, and I was right. I walked in, they looked at me, I looked ridiculous with this Keystone cop hat on my head. They chuckled, it was great. So I just left it on while I was in the media room, stood there watching the monitor the whole time. Now keep in mind, this was a very important part of the production. As a matter of fact, uh, they were taking Jesus down from the cross who had just been crucified. And uh, it was a very moving and emotional song that they were singing. But all of a sudden, as I'm watching this monitor, I realized that the song was ending and that was my cue to be on stage. So I quickly turned, I walked out of the media room, crossed the hallway, came onto stage and began to deliver my lines. Now, sadly, I was in such a hurry to get to the stage that I completely forgot that I still had that Keystone cop hat on my head. Like I told you, I couldn't even feel my head with that wrap that was on my head. So I walked out during, I mean, you got to realize, very pivotal moment. Right over here, they had the tomb for Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were placing the body of Jesus in the tomb. Everybody was in a serious mood. I mean, their hearts were melted from the song they just heard. And out comes Dork Boy with a Keystone Cop hat on his head. Well, you know, I didn't realize what was really happening. And I was walking back and forth. And I was giving my lines as their narrator. Uh, and our orchestra pit was down here uh, below the stage. And in the center was our drummer, Mike Winslow. Well, I noticed he was looking at me a little funny. And every time I'd walk by, he was kind of staring at me like that. And I'm like, what's his problem, man? I'm doing my lines correctly. I've done this three times already. I know I'm doing it. And I, every time I walked by, his head would go back further and he'd just look a little, little different. And so I'm getting mad at that point. And I walk back across and suddenly I thought, wait a second. And I look up at the screen only to see 
this thing sitting on top of my head. And I thought, oh no, oh no. Well, I, even though I was mortified, I kept right on delivering my lines. Now, usually at this point in the story, people assume that I'm embellishing things and that I'm probably exaggerating details. Well, I happen to have a video of the very moment that I walked on stage. Watch. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. There it is, y'all. Took the body of Jesus. And, and I'm placed clueless. It in I've got no idea. Tomb. Somewhat of a sacrifice, knowing how much more likely Joseph was to need it himself. There's Jesus now. being placed in the tomb. The two took the body of the Messiah, prepared it for burial, and then left to ponder their fate. Still don't know, for but I'm about days, to look they up. They searched for answers. They read all there the prophecies oh, concerning Lord. the Messiah. And they understood God's predictions for the very first time. Oh, my goodness. I knew at that moment, I'm fired. Because as, you know, God in his sense of humor would have it, right there on the front row, and this is before we did all this renovation, so the front row was on the floor, Pastor Rod was sitting right there. There was a wooden plank that led down off of the stage, so I literally had to walk the plank toward Pastor Rod, and I wanted him to know this was not on purpose, and so as I walked past, I kind of just under my breath said, I'm so sorry, this was an accident. And Pastor Rod is the king of the deadpan facial expression. I couldn't tell, did he hear me? Was he so mad he couldn't show any emotion? What was going on? Because all I got was, and that's when I knew I need to find a new way to provide for my family. I'm not living here anymore. He is done with me. Well, I, I was very careful to make sure that I found him after the production as quickly as possible. I expressed my sorrow, and yes, I explained it was not on purpose. Now, after a lot of explanation, he eventually believed me. Now, you would think that the incident would have ended right there. Sadly, only 10 minutes later, I was standing in the media room with a large group around me, and we were all watching the very video that I just showed you. And in the middle of me laughing hysterically and yucking it up with everybody around me, I looked up to the doorway entering into the media room, and standing right there looking straight at me was Pastor Rod. And his face said everything I needed to know. Oh, you're real sorry about what you did, huh? And he turned silently and walked away, and I felt about this big. I knew, man, I have messed up royally. My cute attempt at trying to be funny had ruined an important production, and it had caused my leadership and influence to go down a whole lot among the choir and orchestra, much less the staff and congregation. It was a painful moment that I'll never forget. Now, we laughed at the story now, but then I'm going to tell you, there was no laughing as I sat and talked to him just a few minutes later. Now, when you know you've hurt somebody, when you know you've offended them, if you're like me, there's a sinking feeling that kind of is a pit in your stomach. And it's a horrible feeling that, that kind of keeps you awake at night. And you want to do whatever you can as fast as you can to set things right and to resolve the situation. But it's difficult to handle knowing that you've hurt someone that you care about. Maybe you said something in the heat of an argument that you didn't mean. You know those words hurt, but you can't take them back. You made a promise and you didn't keep it. Or you cheated a business partner or, or you ripped somebody off. Maybe you lost your temper and your angry rant or even your physical violence cost you respect and cost you the relationship. You violated your marriage vows with an improper relationship or an affair. Your gossip has damaged many people. Maybe you've even caused division in the church. You're a chronic complainer, but recently you know you went too far. You have a long-running dispute with a family member. Sure, they've done wrong, but you've also done your share as well. Or maybe it's even deeper. Maybe you weren't a good parent, and your parenting left emotional scars on your children. 
I could go on forever with the list because we've all made mistakes. We've all blown it. So what do you do when you've messed up and you, you just desperately want to be forgiven, but you're just not exactly sure how to go about it? Where do you start? Well, I can't cover every imaginable situation. There's really no way for me to to give you an exhaustive, foolproof, cover every conflict script. But I do believe I can share some principles that will help you resolve the conflict and find forgiveness. Now, as a framework for this topic, I want to read three verses from Colossians chapter 3. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. See, as members of the body of Christ, We are called to bring peace in every conflict, at least as it depends on us. And when you are the guilty party, when you're the one whose actions hurt somebody else, conflict being resolved doesn't start with the other person. It starts with you. You have to do your part. Now, I apologize that uh, if you look at your outline, uh, it's about like a book Uh, In fact, much of what I'm going to share with you is actually found in a book that I wrote uh, titled, I Blew It. Uh, This book chronicles uh, 30 plus years of mistakes that I've made and the lessons that I learned from them. And there's an entire chapter in this book that walks you through the process of finding forgiveness and reconciliation. You can pick one up uh, after service at the Hub. All of the proceeds go to our missions project in Rwanda. But this is a big issue, and there are a lot of lessons that we can learn. So let's jump right in. When you need forgiveness, number one, be honest with yourself about what you did and the depth of hurt you caused. See, until you're honest with the seriousness of your mistake, you'll never, ever move forward in wholeness. So you need to say, I did this, and it caused this. Now, this is often the point that a lot of people just drop out of the process. They they don't want to admit their own problem. They they don't want to admit their own sin. Matter of fact, they want to forget it, and they want you to forget it. Their strategy is to ignore it and hope that it goes away, or even worse, to cover it up and make excuses for it. And they're often surrounded by enablers who suggest that that is the best course, but that is not true you got to be completely and totally honest with yourself. That's the first step towards being healthy and whole. Here's the principle. You'll never be honest with others if you can't first be honest with yourself. You'll never be honest with others if you can't first be honest with yourself. You say, well, I I don't want to approach them about it. I mean, they won't listen. They're they're not going to understand. They're just going to shut me out. Don't be pessimistic. Be optimistic. Believe for restored relationship. Believe for healing and for forgiveness. Hope for the best. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Love bears up under anything and everything that comes, is ever ready to believe the best of every person, Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. See, when you know you've done wrong, you need to go to the person and confess quickly. Confess quickly. Don't wait for them to come to you. It's your responsibility. So go as soon as you can, and preferably before they even know what you've done. Now, if at all possible, this should be done in person and and face-to-face, not text message or an email. See, you not only want them to hear your words, but, but you also want them to sense your heart. Seeing your reaction and seeing their response kind of helps you know if you have done an effective job with your apology. I can tell you, after my stupid uh, Keystone Cop moment, I didn't wait for Pastor Rod to come find me. 
As a matter of fact, I immediately went to him. I walked into his office and I confessed what I had done. I didn't minimize it. I didn't make excuses. I confessed and I owned it. When you confess, it gives credibility to your remorse. You see, it helps the person that you've hurt believe that, that your remorse is over what you did, not that you got caught. See, lots of people admit what they've done after they get caught or when the consequences are so severe. Don't wait to be confronted. Confess. Say these three words, I was wrong. Now, I've had to do this on many occasions in my life. And I didn't get caught. In fact, the other person often didn't even know what I had done. But I knew, and I knew if I was ever going to be free, I had to confess. Now, it was painful, and it was messy, but it was right. Number four, confess quickly, but also apologize. Apologize. Now, Pastor Rod does a fantastic job teaching about what an effective apology looks like. There are three components to an effective apology. I'm sorry. That's where you're saying, hey, it's my fault. Never should have happened. I was wrong. No excuses, just I was wrong. And then what can I do to make it right? And then you got to prepare to do whatever they ask you to do to make it right. So I'm sorry, I was wrong. What can I do to make it right? If you miss one of those three components, your apology isn't completely effective. Now I have a little something that some of you might enjoy. It's a s'more. Anybody enjoy eating s'mores? Yeah, they're nice. But there's three components to a s'more, right? You got the graham cracker, You've got the marshmallow, and of course, you've got the chocolate. Now, if you take one of those three components away, I mean, it might be something you can eat, but it's not a s'more. Am I right? A s'more is graham cracker, marshmallow, chocolate. Nobody wants two-thirds of a s'more, and nobody wants two-thirds of your apology. So make sure all three components are there. Let's say it together. What are they? I'm, I was, what can I do to? Absolutely important that all three components are there. Now, in your apology, you got to communicate your sorrow openly to the person that you've wounded. See, don't expect them to just assume that you're sorrowful about what you did. you got to tell them how sorry you really are. And if you aren't visibly sorrowful and broken, then they're probably going to doubt that you've really come to grips with how much you've truly hurt them. But when you understand how you've hurt somebody else, it should always result in brokenness, a deep sorrow for your own wrongs. Now, I do want to caution you, don't put on a show and, and, and fake the emotion because the other person certainly knows and can sense when your emotion is insincere. So you got to remember, they already don't trust you after what you did. If you attempt to mislead them regarding your emotional response to the mistake, then it's only going to set your relationship back that much further. Now, let me walk through some apology principles. As you approach that opportunity to apologize, I want you to remember these things. As you apologize, don't bring up what they did wrong. Remember, it's an apology, not an accusation. If they want to apologize for their part of the conflict, hey, that's their business. Your assignment is to make your wrong right, not their wrong right. Also, don't go over all the details. You're apologizing, not reliving the moment. So if you go back over all the details, likely you're just going to reopen the wound again. Now, if they press for details, just remind them, hey, my goal here is to admit that I was wrong and to make it right. Then don't argue. Don't argue. It's an apology, not an argument. Now, if they try to draw you into an argument, they're just evidencing their own unforgiveness. But don't let their lack of forgiveness co-opt you into continuing the conflict. And don't expect them to respond with an apology and then you get mad if they don't. This is a classic issue in a marriage argument. It goes something like this. Honey, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean any of that. I forgive you. Okay. Uh, aren't you going to say anything? 
I did. I said, I forgive you. I, I love you. Yeah, thanks for that. But what about your apology? Are you going to say something? My apology? You're the one who did wrong. Oh, I did wrong. Okay. And then the whole thing erupts into an argument that's bigger than the original problem was in the beginning. So don't forget a basic principle. You are responsible for you. Do the right thing, whether the other person does the right thing or not. Now, have you ever heard somebody try to apologize like this? I'm sorry if you were offended. If I did something wrong, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I made you mad. I'm sorry if what I said was harsh. An apology that includes the word if isn't an apology. When you use the word if in your apology, you're basically being condescending. You're saying, it's really your issue, but I am apologizing to prove that I'm the bigger person. Now, as you could see on the LED wall behind me, ifs can be distracting. And just like they were distracting when I was talking, when you include an if in your apology, it distracts from what you're saying and completely discredits everything you say after the word if. So don't rationalize, excuse, or explain your action. Just apologize. You see, an excuse is an attempt to say, well, I know I did this, but it's not really my fault. I was never taught right. Or, or I may have hurt you, but hey, you certainly hurt me. Or I was on medication that day. My brain just wasn't working well. <laughs> or I was having a, a bad day. Or, or that's just my personality. Or my least favorite of all, that's just the way I was raised. Oh, let me tell you, that's just the way I was raised, maybe one of the worst excuses to hurt the people around you. Blaming your upbringing for the reason why you sin against other people is basically just accepting defeat and saying, that's just how I am, and I choose to stay that way. It's time to change what you know by learning a different way so you don't commit those same things over and over and pass those same sinful traits on to your children. You don't want that to continue generation after generation after generation. See, here's the principle. Excuses invalidate apologies. They do. Excuses invalidate apologies. Don't bother apologizing if you're going to make excuses. Because people will remember your feeble excuse and they'll completely forget about your apology. See, they don't care why you did it. They only care that you did it. Just apologize. Number five, instead of excuses, dig deep for reasons. See, instead of offering excuses, you've got to discover the reason it happened. A reason uh, is the actions or the conditions that allowed you to get to the point where you're even capable of making that mistake that you made. If you've had an improper relationship with someone that isn't your spouse, excuses would be, well, I deserved better. My husband didn't treat me right. Or, or my needs just weren't being met. Or I just wasn't happy. But instead of sorry excuses, look for the reasons it happened. My relationship with God wasn't where it should be. I was filled with pride. I had unrealistic expectations of my spouse. See, if you make excuses, you will likely make the mistake again. But if you discover reasons, it'll help you to grow beyond your mistake and keep you from falling in that same pit again. See, your goal when you've sinned, it should always be to do all the introspection and the spiritual surgery that's necessary in order to identify what even allowed you to commit that wrong. See, reasons are for you to analyze why you failed. Don't share those reasons with the person you hurt because even the best worded reasons can come across as excuses. Number six, don't put the focus on how the other person responds to your apology. Your focus shouldn't be on whether or not they accept your apology, whether or not they trust you again, or even whether or not they want reconciliation in the relationship. Your focus instead should be on the posture of your heart and the process that God is taking you through in order to get you where he wants you to be. See, if you focus on their response, that takes the weight off of you. You need to feel 
the heaviness. See, it's a healthy thing to feel the weight of the hurt that you've caused because it helps remind you how difficult and profoundly hurtful your mistake truly was. Don't ever forget the look on the victim's face when they heard of your mistake and learned what you'd done. Let that push you toward change, making sure that you allow God to identify and remove all the ugliness in you that needs to come out. Number seven, be willing to take bold steps to regain trust. Be willing to take bold steps to regain trust. No matter what your issue was, no matter how you failed, your sin or your mistake caused someone you love to lose trust in you. So do whatever it takes to regain trust. Be willing to change your phone number if necessary. Give your parents your social media passwords. Better yet, cancel your social media accounts. Install Life360 or, or another tracking app to allow your family to see exactly where you are. Go overboard in communicating what your next move is and why you're making it. If you push back on whatever it is that they ask you to do in order to regain their trust, well, that reveals that you are uncommitted to the restoration process. Now, I'll just give you a warning you will likely think that you should be trusted again long before they are ready to trust you. Students, you really need to understand that. You might feel that you should be ready to be trusted long before your parents are ready to trust you again. And it happens so often in marriages. The offending spouse thinks, hey, this has been long enough. She should trust me now. Or, or he should be over it. Why is he bringing it up? Well, if you are the person who's hurt someone else, it's not up to you to decide when trust has been reestablished. It's up to the person who's been hurt. Number eight, understand that forgiveness is both an event and a process. It's both an event and a process. See, when they make the decision to forgive you, what they're really doing is they're making the decision to enter into the process of forgiveness. The sting of what you did may still be there, but they value the relationship and God's desire for their life greater than they want to hold on to the offense. So they're ready to move forward. But that doesn't mean it's never going to come up again in conversation. You got to understand that part of forgiving you is they may try to make sense of how all of this could even have happened. So instead of avoiding those conversations or resenting the fact that they're taking place, be open, be honest, talk about the things that you've learned and, and that you're learning about yourself. Talk about what God is doing inside of you. You know, depending on the level of the offense, it may uh, mean that they have to both passively and actively forgive you more than once, possibly dozens of times. You might remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Rod taught all about this active forgiveness and how sometimes it's a process. Listen, it's healthy for them to say, I forgive you whenever the sting of the mistake comes back. Don't resent that. Embrace that. Number nine. Include everyone. Include everyone you can in the restoration, in the forgiveness, in the reunion. You know, we have a tendency to draw people into our conflicts, but we don't draw people into our resolutions. And sadly, this happens all the time in churches. Gary and I, we have a problem, so we both tell our wives, our friends, and really anyone who will listen about the problem. By the way, that's called gossip, and it's a sin. But then two weeks later, Gary and I, we kind of patch things up. We have a conversation. Everything's good, but we don't tell everyone else. Matter of fact, we can't tell everyone else because we don't know how far the, star, the story has really gone. And so now people are mad at me for something I did to Gary that he's not mad about anymore. And people are mad at Gary for something he said to me that I've already forgotten about. Here's a great principle. Don't involve other people in your offense, but involve everyone in your reconciliation. Paul said it well in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, if you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes." 
you got to see this for what it is. See, Satan uses conflict and unforgiveness to divide the body of Christ. So you've got to be wise to his strategy, and you've got to include everyone in the reconciliation so we can keep peace and unity in the body of Christ. Finally, when you need forgiveness, don't allow reconciliation with the other person to overshadow your reconciliation with God. Here's the bottom line. You sinned. Your number one priority when you sin is to allow God to restore your heart to where you are sensitive again to his spirit and so that you'll listen to his voice when he tries to help you avoid repeating the same mistake. Jesus emphasized this in Matthew chapter 5. He said, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. See, Jesus said reconciliation is so important. You should even leave church to make it right. Because there's so much writing on this. It's time to find forgiveness. It's time to confess and make things right. See, for some of you, this This is the reason that your spiritual growth has been stalled. Unresolved relational conflict. It's time to make it right. And as you do, you can expect God's peace and blessings. Because when you find restoration in human relationship, it results in spiritual growth and inner peace. Isn't that beautiful? When you find restoration in a human relationship, the results of that is spiritual growth and inner peace. It's time to make things right. And some of you need to start by making it right with God. You've sinned against someone else, but ultimately and most importantly, you've sinned against your Heavenly Father. You need to make it right. You need to confess.